Hi, I'm Jonathan Dunn from the University of Canterbury in New Zealand, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing on improving corpus resources uh, for low-resource languages and also for uh, low-resource populations in the forms of uh, dialects. And of course, as NLP depends on uh, training corpora of various kinds, uh, the lack of these resources is really a bottleneck in terms of having uh, good models, good language technology, uh, for these kinds of languages. And I want to divide uh, my focus uh, in this talk between language identification and corpus validation. The overall framework that we're looking in is that we're collecting digital language use um, from various sources like the web or social media, uh, things like this. And as we use that digital language use to put together uh, a corpus, the two steps that we need to have are to identify what language it is, obviously, uh, so that we can know what we're dealing with, but also to have automated measures of corpus validation so that we can know how consistent, how stable a particular uh, type of data is for a language, for a register, for a dialect, etc. And this is especially important for low resource languages where the sample that we're observing of these languages is by definition uh, sort of a small arbitrary sample. In other words, if we're dealing with a language like English or French and we have hundreds of billions of words available, then we can be really picky in terms of what samples or what parts of the corpora we include um, in order to maintain high quality uh, resources. But how do we do that for a language that only has a few million words? That's one of the questions that we have here. And the work that I'm going to be talking about uh, is drawing on data and also a part of the Earthlings uh, project, which is about having geo-referenced corpora from different uh, sources, social media and the web, and using it to understand uh, language and language use around the world. Uh, and really having a focus on languages other than English and varieties other than uh, sort of North American or Western European varieties uh, to make sure that we represent these languages. Why do we want to do these things? Well, uh, minority languages are rare. So if we just sort of naively crawl data from the web and social media, the vast majority of it actually is a small number of languages. So in both cases, um, based on what we know from that Earthlings project, the top five languages actually represent over 60% of the data. And then over 99.6% uh, of the web data it's from just 50 languages. And so if we think about you know, the 6,000 or 7,000 languages in the world, uh, really we're representing a very small number of that, of those languages. And so the question is, how can we increase our representation of uh, non-majority languages? And I should say that these, um, these, these numbers actually come from already using uh, language ID models that deal with over 400 languages. So, um, if we start off with a sort of a simple off-the-shelf model that has, you know, 100 or 200 languages, we're even going to be compounding the problem more. So this is even after we make an effort to collect data from more places and include more languages. And if you think about uh, false positives, uh, one of the issues that we have is there's so much data from the top languages in the web that a lot of the corpora that we put together for smaller languages um, end up being contaminated or contain largely um, English or majority language samples, right? Because if you have, you know, a language ID classifier and the vast majority of data is going to be in, the, you know, the vast majority of samples that you're classifying are in one of the majority languages, the sheer number of false positives uh, becomes an issue. It's actually a little bit more than this, though, because even within majority languages, we have a pretty strong geographic or demographic skew. And so this is a map of sort of the sources of web data. So if we go in the common crawl and we grab web data in Spanish and we use uh, some georeferencing things based on the top level domain to say what country it's from, well, if we were just ingesting as much data as we could, the vast, vast majority of the corpus that we ended up putting together would represent European Spanish, you know. But obviously people all around the world uh, use Spanish. And so one of the things that we did um, a couple years ago in a project uh, was population-based sampling. And the basic idea is let's put together a corpus of, in this case, Spanish, that actually represents where speakers of Spanish come from around the world. 
But the point here is not only do we have a skew towards majority languages, uh, like Indo-European languages, but even within those majority languages, there's a strong skew from digital sources towards uh, sort of inner circle populations. Um, the, Geo the Earthlings project and what I'm talking about is looking at web data and social media. Another big source of data that we always have is Wikipedia. Um, and of course, because many people are contributing to Wikipedia articles, uh, we don't have this kind of georeferencing. Um, but there has been work on saying where are the people located who are actually editing Wikipedia. Um, and what we see is also a strong geographic bias, where some places are contributing a lot more. And these are, are actually uh, relative to internet users. And so one of the issues in many parts of the world is a relatively low percentage of the population that has access uh, to the internet in the first place. And so this is even controlling for different levels of access. But the other point here is, even if we're looking at these majority languages, all the sources that we typically use are skewed towards certain populations. So our challenge is to identify and validate corpora for low resource languages. So what do we do for those languages that aren't in the top 50 that we talked about? And also to identify and validate corpora for low resource dialects or populations. So even in you know languages like English or French, how do we say, okay, uh, this is you know a Nigerian speaker of English or a Caribbean speaker of French, so that we can actually represent the different populations who are using these languages. Uh, and these are both of the problems I think that we have in terms of creating and validating these kinds of corpora. So the two things I want to talk about are corpus validation and language ID. And I'm going to start off by thinking about corpus validation. And so in the, in the projects that I'll be talking about, we take corpora for a number of different languages from three sources or three registers. And those are from Twitter, from the web, and from Wikipedia. And so we want to do various experiments on uh, comparing corpora within and between these different um, sources in order to put together uh, measures that we can use for automated uh, corpus validation. So the papers I'll be talking about looked at you know, between 39 and 60 languages uh, across these corpora, which again is still only a pretty small sample of the overall languages, but these are languages that we have more data on, and so we can do corpus validation experiments. So for example, we can say, here's a measure of corpus similarity that tells us how homogenous a particular type of collection is. And if we have a language that has a billion words, we can actually repeat that collection over many different random samples and figure out how much confidence we can have in each of our measurements. And that's exactly what we do. Um, and we have two measures uh, that we look at in this line of work. One is homogeneity. And homogeneity is uh, basically, if I take um, you know, tweets or web pages in this low resource language or in a medium resource language, um, how likely is the corpus to be consistent or to be stable, to be similar to itself? And so we measure this by taking corpus, breaking it up into many smaller chunks, and comparing those chunks pairwise to one another. Um, the chunks are about 10,000 words um, each. And so, you know, if we have a million word corpus, that gives us, you know, a fairly large number of chunks that we can put together all these pairwise um, measures and figure out what properties of that corpus would actually be consistent or stable um, regardless of what subset of it we'd actually observed. The other thing that we think about is similarity. And the question here is, okay, if I just train a model on Wikipedia corpora, or if I train a model on Twitter corpora, these are different registers, which means they're different contexts of production. So we have different communicative purposes, we have different audiences, we have different topics. How much do these particular sources of data generalize? And this is important because if we think about um, you know, a training corpus as representing the language use of a particular population, well, most of the way that we use language is not the kinds of expository ways that we would use in a Wikipedia corpus. Um, so how do we represent uh, the actual language usage of particular people? And how much does it make a difference uh, what sources we draw from? 
Um, another way of thinking about this is, you know, if we look at English or French or Spanish, we have many different registers. So for an English model, we can use, you know, movie subtitles and uh, legislative corpora and novels and news articles and just an almost limitless set of different registers in order to give, you know, a well-rounded view of language use. But one of the issues that we have with low resource languages is not just that we only have a few million words, but a lot of times those uh, few million words um, come from a very small set of registers. You know, so we might have some tweets, we might have some formal legal documents, we might have some sort of, you know, religious translations, but that is not going to give us the full spectrum of uh, language usage. And so one of the things that we want to do in higher resource languages is understand the degree to which that kind of context actually has an influence uh, on things. And so uh, in uh, a recent paper in Lingua, uh, we put together various corpus similarity measures um, and figure out which ones are robust and how well they work across different languages, where we can think about different languages as representing different types of morphology, different types of writing systems, different genetic groupings, and how stable uh, are these kinds of measures. And so in a graph like this, what we're doing is we're taking a corpus and we're breaking it down into chunks of 10,000 words. And then for each uh, pair of chunks, we get a similarity measurement. Um, so how, how similar are these between 0 and 1? Um, in the paper, we talk about a, a bunch of different uh, ways of doing this. They're all based on uh, frequencies because we don't really want to have a, a, a presence of a model in this kind of research. So we don't want to train a language model and use that to compare different samples because then we would always have to worry about how we were training that language model in the first place, especially since we're trying to work with low resource languages and low resource populations. But uh, in a graph like this, higher values are towards the top, lower values are towards the bottom, and we have them shaded in blue and orange, where blue means these two corpora are from the same register. So these are, we're comparing web pages to web pages, and orange is saying uh, these are different. So we're comparing web pages to tweets, web pages to Wikipedia, or something like this. And what we see across languages is that we have a different uh, mean. But in each case, the corpus similarity measures let us uh, sort of get a distribution of how similar or related different parts of the corpus on are. And one of the things about this is that we can always distinguish between corpora that are from the same source and corpora from, that are from different sources. Another way of thinking about this is the distribution of similarity values. And so here we're looking at a plot for English. And um, on the left we have in-domain features, and on the right we have out-of-domain features. So basically the question here is how repeatable is this if we assume out-of-domain features? And out-of-domain features are important because we have to, it takes a corpus to put to do feature selection. And in low resource settings we don't have a whole lot of corporate available in order to evaluate, um, you know, feature settings or you know algorithm parameters in terms of putting together the corpus similarity measures. And so we want to see how much do these measures actually depend on having a lot of data in order to fine tune them. Uh, and they're usually um, uh, rather consistent. But in this case, we're looking at the distribution of similarity values. And so in each of these plots, we're seeing two different things. On the left, we have homogeneity. So we're comparing a Twitter corpus to other Twitter corpora. We're playing web corpora to other web corpora. And then on the right, we have cross-register pairs, which is similarity. So, for example, one of the things that we find across all the languages that we look at is that tweets are much more homogenous than web pages. And if we think about it from the background of register, well, a tweet has a relatively limited range of communicative purposes, but a web page could be a huge number of different types of document. And so we're going to see more heterogeneity in the web corpora. Um, and so it's nice to be able to measure that. And then in terms of similarity, what we see is that on the right, in most of the languages, um, you know, Twitter and Wikipedia are the most different because these are the most different types of communicative situations. On the other hand, Wikipedia and the web are uh, the most similar. So we can kind of 
put together these graphs uh, across languages, and this is a way of starting to think about validating corpora. Why is it a way to start thinking about validating corpora? Well, for collecting data that's you know billions of words for a particular language, we want to be able to detect outliers. We want to be able to detect outliers because our language ID is going to have a lot of false positives. And so we need to know where uh, in the GigaWord corpora we have these bad samples. Now, one of the questions that we asked in the Lingua paper is, how well does this extend to low resource families. And so we looked at, take a look at Austro Austronesian languages, and then uh, even within a subfamily of Austronesian languages, Polynesian languages. And so this, these are uh, settings where we have a lot less data, we have fewer registers, and we have sort of different registers available in each one. Um, but, but basically the reason of doing this particular part of the study is to figure out how well did those methods that worked on Languages where we had enough data to really uh, evaluate it, what if we take sort of the best parameters and evaluate them without doing, you know, a larger sort of grid search approach um, on these lower resource languages? Uh, and it turns out that they port quite well uh, to these. And so we're still able to figure out, even without much training data, you know, what the different sources of data are in the corpora. And this is, again, important because we can do corpus validation without a tremendous amount of training data. The other question that we want to think about is, to what degree does this extend beyond registers? And so in because a lot of our data is from digital sources, you know, the web or Wikipedia, what if we try to use these on much more traditional uh, written sources, like books or bank documents or parliamentary proceedings, or et cetera, et cetera. And we can also use the same method to look at uh, many different registers. So in both cases, we're looking at how well does this generalize, um, and it, in fact, it does generalize well. Um, now, to what degree can a corpus similarity measure that we want to use to help us validate our training corpora actually help us to understand models, right? So basically, we what we want is NLP models language technology for low resource languages, low resource dialects. Well, what is the relationship between corpus similarity and model similarity? And to do this, essentially what we do is we train word embeddings, character embeddings, uh, the skip gram algorithm on a, on a data set. And then we compare the embedding space that we end up with with an embedding space that we end up with if we had trained on a different data set. And so we can say, what is the similarity of the corpora or the training data upstream and what is the similarity of the models or the embedding space downstream? Uh, for this, we look at uh, 17 different languages. Again, a large number of language families, a large number of writing systems. And we want to figure out how reliable is this um, relationship across languages. And so basically, we take our three pairs of corpora, web and Twitter, Twitter and Wikipedia, web and Wikipedia, and we train embeddings at different sizes of training data. And this allows us to simulate low resource settings at various uh, amounts of data. Um, there are many languages where we might be able to get 100 million words. There are many languages where we'd only be able to get 10 million words. And so we can set our measure of reliability according to how much data we have uh, to work with. But the two main findings that we have here um, are, first of all, that there's a pretty good relationship um, between the similarity of embeddings after training and the similarity of the corpora before training. This relationship becomes stronger the more data that we have. And what this means is we can have a pretty good estimate of how different two different embeddings would be only given the training data. Um, but also, and per perhaps more importantly, uh, we have a pretty good estimate of homogeneity of models given homogeneity of um, the training data. And so basically here what we did is we said, okay, well, what if I pretend, I take a high resource language like Arabic or German or Greek, and I pretend that I have a very small amount of data. And so I'm trying to uh, either train an embedding space or you know do domain adaptation uh, on a pre-trained model from a majority language. And how different would my output be depending on what subset of that corpora I happen to have access to. 
And then we tried to predict the reliability of our downstream model given that corpus homogeneity measure. And you remember the corpus homogeneity measure is we take this training corpus, we break it into a bunch of different chunks, and then compare those chunks to one another. And it turns out that there's actually a fairly strong uh, relationship here, which means that we can use the corpus homogeneity measure to give us an indication, an estimate, of how reliable our model would be that we trained on that corpus. Uh, and this is quite important um, because it extends across languages, and it's also quite important because we can estimate the corpus similarity, the corpus hom homogeneity measures, with a lot less data. So that part of the talk is thinking about how do we validate and compare these corpora that we're collecting um, because we get so much data and we know there's such a bias towards majority languages that the number of false positives uh, is gonna be through the roof, um, which means that we have to have a way of finding outliers and of sort of maintaining corpus quality over time. But I wanna turn my attention now to language identification uh, and how can we make the models better uh, in a way that we can actually identify the minority languages, right? So one way is to be able to use corpus validation, corpus similarity measures to screen out false positives, but of course the other way is simply to have a better model with fewer false positives. And so what we look at in this paper is the trade-off between more languages and uh, more reliability. Uh, and we focused in particular on the Pacific region, and so we trained models that range from an inventory of 200 languages to an inventory of 800 languages. And all of those models maintained a focus on the Pacific region. And so one of the things I'll talk about in a minute is how we can use geography to improve language identification as well. Um, and basically, we use some of the standard architectures that we have uh, for language identification. We also used uh, more neural methods like an LSTM. But as in a lot of other work, uh, those kinds of models don't work as well for language ID, and so we don't directly evaluate them. And it turns out that uh, the best classifier uh, for languages, even as we scale them up, uh, is this fast text uh, skipgram based um, classifier, which is nice because it's also quite fast. Um, first of all, it's able to distinguish between the Austronesian languages. So here we have all, a list of all the different uh, Austronesian languages in the model. And what we want to do is make sure that, okay, our overall F-score, our overall precision and recall are quite high, but are there particular languages of interest that are being missed by that? And so we can evaluate that. But our next question is, to what degree does increasing the amount of languages in our model decrease the performance that we have? And so here, as we go down in the table, we have more languages, and then we have um, our overall F-score, and then we have our, speci our specifically uh, Austronesian language F-score. And so if we only have 200 languages in the model, the F-score is you know, 0.994, so it's quite high. Uh, and that also means that, of course, we have high precision and high recall. As we increase the amount of languages, we really have um, a floor, so we don't get beyond uh, 0.96. But it's also important to keep in mind what is the performance on the particular set of languages that we're interested in, the Pacific languages. But the point here is to figure out what is the trade-off where I can increase more, I can increase the languages in the model so that I can have corpora representing more languages. But as I do that, my false positives, my false negatives are going to increase. And so I'm going to have less certainty within each one of those categories. And again, we can use the corpus similarity measures after we've identified the language to try to clean this up um, uh, so that we don't propagate that error uh, further. Um, another thing that we have to evaluate if we're going to use a fast text classifier is to what degree does compressing the model uh, reduce the performance. And so we're able to put together um, a model that has pretty good performance, but is also um, more compressed. Um, and finally, um, we ask about stability. And this is an issue with many different types of classifiers, but especially with the sort of embedding-based classifier because of instability in the embeddings themselves. And so basically what we did here is we just we 
retrained the model five different times, shuffling the training data differently to say, to what degree is this performance an artifact of one particular run? And so we have you know, the minimum and the maximum for both precision and recall. And in some cases, there's quite a big gap, right? So for some languages, there's quite a range. But for most languages, uh, there's a much smaller range. But this is about understanding how stable that language ID model is, that particular architecture, um, is it always going to work well, or is it only going to work well um, in a particular instance? Uh, we also did some considerations of uh, code switching, uh, because another issue that we have is that in there, there ends up being phrases in majority languages, and specifically in English uh, words, uh, in many different languages. And so the question is, how well can we identify those English words um, and use that for corpus cleaning? Um, and so here we're able to leverage that basic language ID framework that we have. Um, and so we can train a code switching model using the same kind of data that we use to train a language ID model and basically use that to find English words and phrases in these smaller corpora. And again, what we want to have is large corpora that represent specific populations using minority languages. Um, and we want those corpora to be validated uh, in terms of their homogeneity, and we want them to have as little influence or little uh, material from majority languages as possible. And so a code switching algorithm is another sort of post-language ID uh, cleaning method for improving the quality of those kinds of data sets. And I want to end with some thoughts about using geography to help us improve language identification. Uh, and there's a lot of work to be done here because essentially data that we collect from different places uh, represents different populations of speakers. And so a spatial error analysis for language ID uh, is a way to figure out um, where our mistakes are being made, right? And so in the on our Earthlings uh, project, we have a couple maps up there of um, lid agreement. And so we have two different language ID models um, uh, that my group is published on, and we can compare the labels that we get from each of those models. And one of the issues with language ID is, you know, given the very large number of languages, it would be a very insurmountable task to have, you know, specific native speaker linguist informants for all the languages uh, in order to make sure that they're working well. But we can use geography and say, okay, in this particular part of a country, I know that that the population speaks, you know, these five languages or these two languages. And we can find the places where the models disagree with one another. So there's some error going on. They're either one's right and one's wrong, or they're both wrong. And use that to guide the collection of data to improve the resources. Now we can also do this within a country. And so here we're looking at the agreement between two language ID models by different cities in New Zealand um, on tweets. And so in some places, uh, we have more homogenous populations like in Dunedin, and we have uh, a much higher agreement. But then there are some parts of the, uh, of the country where even though there's a large number of samples, um, the relative agreement of the two models is much lower, right? And so basically, we can do a spatial error analysis to say, where do the models not agree, and then focus our attention on those places as the places most likely to improve our language ID models. A different way that we can use geography to improve LID as, is as an a priori, right? So in the, in the paper we just talked about, we we're thinking about using language ID to build corpora for the South Pacific or the Pacific region. And the point is that if you're collecting data and you're able to figure out where that data is from, you have an expectation, you have an a priori um, uh, measure, if you will, of what languages you expect to see, right? So if you see a Polynesian language in the Pacific, then that's very likely. And so even though it's a low resource language, and even though in a billion words, you might only have a couple thousand words in that minority language, you're expecting that minority language. On the other hand, if you find you know, an indigenous language of North America, in the Pacific, that's going to be much less likely. Or if you find a Polynesian language in North Africa, that's going to be much less likely. And so basically, um, the idea here is to come up with um, 
you know, region-specific language ID models where we give preference to the languages that we expect to find in that region. And the idea is that we can reduce the number of false positives uh, by only by taking into consideration the languages that we expect to see in a particular place. And again, we want to reduce the number of false positives so that we produce uh, cleaner, more valid corpora that we can then use for training models. Uh, but the basic idea in this talk is, you know, sort, digital sources of language use are a really great source for large data sets that we need for training NLP, for building new language technology. But two of the problems that we have in terms of collecting this data are first of all identifying what language it is outside of those top languages and of validating these very large corpora and figuring out how many outliers there are. And so uh, the work that I've been presenting is about trying to improve language geography uh, by leveraging geographic information and by understanding how the false positive rate changes as we include the number of languages in the model. And then combining that with corpus validation, which we can use after language ID um, as a sort of after the fact post hoc uh, cleaning method. In other words, uh, we can use corpus validation or these corpus similarity measures I was talking about to say, okay, our language ID model predicts that all of this language is from this minority language, um, but how much of it is actually actually um, consistently similar to the core training data that we have for that language. And if we have our language ID giving us a lot of false positives, that's going to give us a lot of outliers in the corpus. And so we can think about corpus validation measures as taking place after language identification to try to clean up the errors that are introduced by language identification um, just as that, that we get from using that kind of classifier with a large number of classes and some of the classes being so uh, so much more frequent than others. So the skew there is incredible. Um, but thanks.